Welcome to Access Database Design. I'm Trainer Lori. The steps in order to create an Access Database, what I call the seven steps to heaven, is really database theory, and we're going to be covering that in the next few minutes. I started creating my first databases by creating one for a hotel chain, and it was supposed to be stay nine nights, get the ni tenth night free. It was a VIP uh, Access Database. But after I created it and uh, instituted it and all the front desk clerks started asking for customer information, I went back and asked the general managers what would they like in the database. I should have asked them first, shouldn't I? <laughs> and they said, well, these are our best customers. We'd like to be able to mail them a birthday card. And while we had their address information, the owner had never thought to ask for the birthday information. So before you ever start creating the database, begin with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey tells us in habit number two of those highly effective habits. So design the reports before the database. What do the reports look like now? What do users want from the new reports? And maybe they don't know yet. <laughs> so you, that's a little harder to design if you don't have a clue what you want the database to do. But it's a good idea to think about what do you want it to do before you ever start designing it. I would suggest this think process takes about a week. While you're designing the database, you want to think about the reports, but actually the last thing you can create in your database is your reports. Why? Because you have to have data in the database to create the report. So the way you actually, I think the easiest way to create a report is using the report wizard. It um, walks you right through the process. You can also export to Excel. The nice thing is, is once you save, uh, once you do one, you can save it, and there'll be a, a list of them. You just click a button, essentially, uh, to export it over and over again. The second step in our design process is to think about the tables. Okay, first we thought about what kind of data we want in the database. Now we think about the tables which will house the data. In Excel, like most of us use Excel to store data now, uh, we would probably have duplicates. For example, I might have uh, multiple employees. If I'm keeping track of the employees and their orders, I have multiple order dates, and I have multiple products. Well, our goal in Access is to avoid duplicate information. For example, this is what a table might look like in Access. This is an employees table, and see the plus signs down the side here? I click on one of those plus signs, and it will show me all the orders for that employee. I click on a plus sign for orders, and I see all the products for that order. That is because this is a one-to-many relationship and these tables are related. And that's what we have to do in Access. Good news, if you don't think you can do it yourself, if you already have your data in an Excel spreadsheet, for example, when you bring it into Access, there is a helper that will ask you, do you want me to go ahead and split this into multiple tables for you? But if you're going to create it on your own, you have to do the thinking. You have to decide what would it be. So in our case, one employee has many orders. And therefore, I would have at least two tables, one for the employees and one for the orders. So I don't have duplicate orders inside my employees table. So now I have one just for the employees and one for the orders. But each order has many products. Therefore, in this situation, I would need probably at least three tables. So one employee has many orders and one order has many products. So now I have three tables storing my data instead of just one. And this is the way Access would de uh, decide it for you. So this is syntax that will help you design your database and which tables you need. One blank has many blanks and the blank is what you have to fill in. If you can fill in the first one and the second one, then you're going to need at least two tables. So uh, it could be, uh, for example, one um, student has many grades, if you're keeping track of students and their grades. Uh, one office building has many um, tenants. So you can see this syntax will help you build your database based on blanks become tables and then it will show you the relationships. We'll talk about relationships in a minute. If we're going to create our tables, I would suggest you design them on paper first or maybe make them in Excel first. And if you've thought it through, if you've given it that week of think time, then you can go right into Create Table Design and you can fill in the blanks for all the field names. Now there's more to it than just field names. You also have to know data type and field properties, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is what a table looks like in Datasheet View. 
versus design view. You can see a design view here, this data sheet view. The, simply right click on the name of the table to go back and forth between the two. So you'll design it in design view and you might do your data entry in data sheet view or certainly see the data in data sheet view. If you prefer, if your data is already in Excel, then you would go to external data. Then we decide the fields, which fields go on each table. In this case, I have an employee table, and I might want name, title, and address. But here's the question. Do I just want name, or do I want first name, last name? Or do I want first, middle, last? Or prefix first, middle, initial, last, suffix? <laughs> Th these are decisions that you have to make when you're deciding what fields go on the table. So if I think name, do I really want to break it down so that I can sort by last name? This is called normalizing your data. And this is one way that you can normalize your data. In other words, to break it into as small a field as you care about. To insert our field names, we do it in design view. And this is where we need to know naming conventions. So what does that mean? That means, see, I notice I have attendee ID, no spaces, but both attendee and ID are capitalized. We often call that camel case. That means that it looks like a camel. The first letters uh, of each word is um, capitalized, but there's no spaces. Our goal is to be consistent. Now, in Access, you can put spaces in field names. It is allowed. However, it's not a good idea. It's not a good practice. It's not good naming convention. In case you want to upgrade to a, a larger database, like a SQL database, um, some sort of mainframe database, which does not allow it, that could be a problem. Also, when you're writing code, it is a problem. So that's why we don't like to have field names in our, um, in our with spaces. Also, you have to choose the data type. There's so many data types and so many options for them. We will cover that in a different class. But you do, by default, you'll get text, but you may want something else like auto number, which is a number that automatically increases. Once we have our fields in, we need to determine the relationships. Now, we have already been thinking about relationships because I know that one employee has many orders and one order has many products. So that is a relationship. To form this relationship, your table must have a unique identifier. This unique identifier is called different things in different databases. In Access, it's called the primary key. This unique identifier means that every table must have one, but every record must be unique. Therefore, my employee ID is going to be different from your employee ID. That's why that auto number is so popular, because it will automatically do that for you. Access wants to put a primary key in your table. If you create a table, it wants to create a, a primary key for you. But it will not create the link. That primary key from one table, and notice it's the bold one here, it's the, and it's also named after the name of the table, which makes it very uh, easy to recognize it elsewhere. This is a good naming convention. So it's employee ID. That's the unique identifier in the employees table. But notice the line. As it is linked to the orders table, it also appears in the orders table. It is not the primary key in the orders table. It's just another field that helps link the two tables. In fact, it is a one-to-many relationship. It is known as the foreign key. There is no way you can see the word foreign key. It will not identify it anywhere as the foreign key. The only way you can tell is because it's got the many side, the infinity symbol, the many side of the relationships. Notice that orders, the orders table, has its own unique identifier, its own primary key, order ID. So the foreign key is critical to form the link. To create the relationship, we go to Database Tools Relationship. This is not some place that you go to all the time. You do it very rarely. Simply click the primary key in the one table and drag it to the foreign key in the other table. That is why you must have that foreign key already in there. You have to do that ahead of time. And when you do that, this box opens up and says, would you like to enforce referential integrity? The answer is yes. Make sure that you check that. It is not on by default, and then click OK. What properties, which is backdoor into code, uh, do I want to prevent the GEIGO? GEIGO is garbage in, garbage out. So you'll find that under your normal fields, down at the bottom, so you click in the one field that you want to set the properties for at a time, and then look down below for your field properties. For example, let's say I want the address field to be required. 
Then, under the required, I would use the word yes. You can uh, type it in or choose from the list. There'll be a drop-down list. Or I want the phone to be numbers. And so you would put in an input mask, and there's a helper to help you with that, a wizard that will help you put that in in the correct code. The fee must be at least $100. Well, if I know how to write these kinds of codes in Excel, then it's uh, the validation rule is something that I will be able to use here. The city automatically appears. I think this is the number one thing that we should do in all of our properties is set the default. If you know that New York City is going to be my number one target market, uh, why would I want to type that in every single time when I'm doing data entry? So if I put it once in here as the default value, then it will automatically appear. Number six in our seven steps is form design. How can I make the data entry user friendly? I call this foolproof. If I use a form to do data entry, and by the way, that's not Nancy DeBolio, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> If I use a form, then my user uh, finds it very easy. Now, I've found a lot of users really like Excel. And they like putting data entry into Excel. If that's the case, I may let them do it in a table. However, with a form, you can set all kinds of uh, security, and you can allow them to see only the things you want them to see, uh, even maybe no record except the one that they're doing data entry on. The best way to create a form, I think, is to use the form wizard. Just uh, click on the table that you want to create the form from, click Create Form Wizard, and it walks you through the process. You get to choose, and you have a few more options than if you just clicked the form right here, which will create a form faster, but you don't have as many options. And then finally, our seventh step is once I've created the database, I need to make sure that users will be able to know what they're supposed to do. Because you may have a long list of tables, a long list of queries, a long list of forms and reports, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do first. Even if I create it myself, I may forget, what do I want to get into? So one way to make the database easy to navigate is by using a custom group. If uh, on the left side where the navigation panel is, if you click the drop-down arrow, you will have the option to create a custom group here. And you can uh, click and drag just those tools in it that you'll be using, just those objects that you will use all the time. So you can hide or not use uh, all the, the ones that are there uh, to support the ones that you will be using. Maybe a friendlier option is what I call the PhD form. Now, uh, we wouldn't want to call any of our coworkers or uh, users of our database a dummy, so we would, might call them uh, a darlin'. So I call this a push here darlin' form. Push here darlin'. See, it's very easy, even for me. I, I may have created the database, but I don't want to have to try to dig through and try to find what I should do. So I will put buttons on a form. The way you do that is to go into Design View and use the button tool. This is called the button tool. And the button is a wizard, and it will walk you through. It says, what would you like to happen when you press the button? Do you want it to open a form, open a query, uh, open a macro, and uh, make things happen as a result of it? That's all. See you next time.